All right, take five seconds to read the question and then we'll go through the answer. All right, so we have a 56 year old man, past medical history of alcohol use and withdrawal seizures, brought to the emergency department from a homeless shelter, it has acute onset confusion, ataxia, and agitation. Is unable to recall the time of his last drink. Blood pressure is 168 over 68. So that's pretty high. You know what's interesting about this pressure is that there's actually, the systolic pressure is pretty elevated, but the diastolic pressure is 68. Okay, so sometimes this might be like a little clue of aortic regurgitation, but let's keep reading. Heart rate is 126, that's very high. Okay, so that's something else that's pretty important. Respiratory rate is 16, okay, a little high. On physical exam, he appears to have diffuse muscle atrophy, peripheral edema in the distal lower extremities. Patient also appears tremulous, okay, he might be withdrawing from alcohol withdrawal. Has visible nystagmus, okay, also consistent with uh, alcohol use on testing of extraocular muscles. An EKG is performed showing sinus tachycardia with no evidence of ST segment elevation or depression. Chest radiography is shown below. Look at all of that edema here in the lungs. So this patient has, you know, a lot of fluid in the lungs. It's not, you know, if it was like consolidation, we might be saying, okay, if there was one area where we just had some consolidation, that might be more uh, suggestive of like a pneumonia. But when you see all of this fluid in the lungs, it immediately strikes me for pulmonary edema, especially because the patient has peripheral edema in the distal lower extremities. So let's just talk about what's going on with this person really quick before we get to this. So we got someone who has a history of alcohol use, history of withdrawal seizures, okay? And they're giving you a very classic triad. When you think about alcohol use, you know, the ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, right? You know where this is going probably. And the um, confusion, usually, and we talked about this a lot in the neuro section. This is all very classic for a Wernicke's encephalopathy. Okay, very classic Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Um, and usually, Wernicke's encephalopathy is associated with thiamine deficiency. Okay, so remember, when you go to treat Wernicke encephalopathy, you want to give the thiamine before you give the glucose. Okay, and again, this is evidenced by the acute onset confusion, ataxia, uh, some agitation here, and then the visible nystagmus. Really, it's in the opto findings. Sometimes they'll put in here, you can kind of correlate with this if it's the right clinical picture. But the other thing that you want to make this connection with, so we're talking about vitamin B1 deficiency, thiamine deficiency, this patient's also fluid overloaded. Like, why is this patient fluid overloaded? Why do they have peripheral edema? Why is the heart rate 126? So there's obviously more going on here. Now, remember, B1 deficiency, which is associated with Wernicke encephalopathy, actually can cause a dry or wet beriberi. Okay, so this can cause a dry or wet beriberi. So now you can also have a mix of the two from B1 deficiency. Now the dry beriberi is more of a peripheral neuropathy usually. And there's a lot of different findings, but peripheral neuropathy potentially contributing to the ataxia, uh, hyporeflexia, more neurologic signs, and nystagmus are all associated with dry. The wet beriberi though is of particular interest of, to us here because the patient has this uh, pulmonary edema, which the wet beriberi is more associated with high output cardiac failure. So in other words, these patients will tend to have very high heart rates, potentially very high pressures, and generally have a very high uh, cardiac output. And remember, alcohol use is also associated with a dilated cardiomyopathy, which is more of like a more of systolic heart failure. So those patients actually typically will have uh, a high heart rate, but a low ejection fraction. So I'm just going to put heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Okay, so this is very classic. Systolic heart failure is also associated with alcohol use, which causes a dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, putting all of this together with this patient, and you don't need to, and I'm going through this in greater detail than you probably need to know for this question, but um, you know, putting this all together, let's just go through some of the answers. So a wide fixed splitting of an S1 heart sound. So off the bat, this one should be the one that you can kind of rule out pretty quickly because it's really hard to hear the splitting of the S1 heart sound. There's really not a classic pathology associated with that. However, the wide fixed splitting of the S2 heart sound is very classically associated with atrial septal defects. Now, there's really not any mention of any history of atrial septal defect. It would be somewhat unusual to start a presentation or a board question in a 56 year old, especially in the setting of all these other things going on. It's not very classic. Now you could definitely get fluid overloaded um, with atrial septal defects. But again, in the setting of all the problems this patient has, this is certainly not the best answer.
Okay, if let's skip down to D, prominent S4 heart sound. Remember, the S4 heart sound is classically associated with ventricular hypertrophy. Classically, uh, alcohol induced cardiomyopathy is going to be dilated, so it's not going to be the ventricular hypertrophy, it's going to be more of the systolic dysfunction that you're going to see. So it's going to tend to be more on the side of the volume overload. Um, so again, prominent S4 heart sound, especially in, you know, in this patient that has pulmonary edema, this patient has peripheral edema, and this patient has a significant history of alcohol use and vitamin B1, potentially a vitamin B1 deficiency. Putting these together, it's much more likely that this is a high output cardiac failure in the setting of dilated cardiomyopathy, much less likely to be associated with the S4 heart sound than the S3. Now, paradoxical splitting of the S2 heart sounds, this would be very classic in the setting of really severe aortic stenosis, which can actually present similar to this, right? You can have peripheral edema, you can have um, pulmonary edema, but there's really no mention of any heart murmur in the question stem. And this, again, isn't quite as classic. It wouldn't be the most expected finding. Much more likely in the setting of this volume overloaded state would be a prominent S3 heart sound. Now, let me tell you this. If you didn't put all of this together, if you had like 20 seconds, this was your last question on the test, and you don't know what to do and you're panicking, I mean, look at all of this fluid, right? You got peripheral edema, you got fluid in the lungs, right there, I mean, this makes it pretty straightforward. It's volume overload, S3 heart sound. So a lot of these questions, you don't need to know all the information, but it's somewhat reassuring um, and kind of makes you feel a little bit better if you know what's going on and put the pieces together.